1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, got a couple weeks left here in this chapter, again, very lengthy chapter, 58 verses, and a very important chapter, a lot uh, that is in here for us uh, to glean from. Um, it's good to be reminded that, uh, especially uh, as we get into uh, tonight in verse 35, um, you know, Paul by now, he's established the fact that there is a resurrection of the body. And now he's going to begin to describe what that's like. And it's important to, to realize that this is one of Paul's earliest epistles. The only other uh, New Testament scriptures that Paul has written at this time is First and Second Thessalonians in the book of Galatians. Um, there's a few other, I think the gospel, uh, one of the, the gospels, maybe the gospel of Mark has been written by this time, uh, but not much else. And you have to remember that people didn't have those in circulation as we would have them today. So what little New Testament there was, people didn't have access to. And so if you can put yourself in the place of the church at Corinth, the things that Paul is going to begin to describe in the rest of this chapter, are, they're absolutely brand new to brand new Christians. Uh, you, you, they, they've never heard these things before. You know, most people, if you're in church on a Wednesday night, uh, you're probably the people that, have someone of a regular Bible reading uh, life, and you've at least heard preaching from these passages time and time again, and you've read it. So even if you don't have a full, let, let's say, a full understanding or a full comp comprehension, you, you, you're at least familiar with it. They had, they had none of that. And the things that Paul reveals in the rest of this chapter, these brand new things, these are not material things. They're mystical things. They're not physically tangible. They are... Uh, they're not verified by what is seen, but by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. They are uh, things that they are going to accept by faith. Well, they're taking God at his word at the things that he will do. And you've got to remember, again, at this time, the only thing that these people knew was a grave. That's all the world knew was a grave. They didn't, they didn't speak of resurrection. They looked for a Messiah. But they did not speak of resurrection, certainly not for themselves. And so now this is, if, if you can j just put yourself in that, 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 that place and, and, and put, them, put yourself in their place and look at it in, in, from their point of view, this is really astounding what Paul is about to reveal. Now this chapter is divided, the rest of this chapter is divided into two parts, verses 35 through 50 and then verses 51 through 58. I'm not going to be able to get close to anywhere near all of that tonight. Uh, but we're going to probably read from verse 35 down to verse 33. And look at what it, Paul says here now uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain it may have chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it has pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the, cel the, glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Heavenly Father, uh, one more time we come to you tonight and we ask for your blessing on your word and the spirit that gave it and inspired it uh, to the infant church thousands of years ago. Lord, may he break fresh bread for us and Lord, uh, to, uh, give us light uh, for living today and we'll give you our thanks for it in Jesus' name, amen. So now in verse 35, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body they, do they come? Okay, Paul uh, we, we accept the fact, Paul realizes that by this point, as they read this letter, okay, they're going to agree, there is a resurrection. We'll, we'll give you that. 
And Paul begins to answer the questions that he realizes the church is going to naturally ask. Okay, how is this going to happen? What kind of body will be resurrected? Those are, um, those are very fair and natural questions. And so his immediate answer is, thou fool. Now, that initial response might seem harsh on the surface, but it's really, it's not. The word uh, fool here in the Bible can be used in more than one way. It, it doesn't refer to somebody uh, that makes a rash or a foolish or a stupid decision. It really, it refers to somebody in, in, the, in this context, it refers to somebody uh, who is ignorant or lacks understanding. It's just somebody that doesn't know. And so, again, this is brand new information. So Paul begins to help them understand by using several analogies or examples or illustrations, if you will, that, that they do understand, that they do comprehend. And he answers uh, in simplicity something that is very complex. So he answers complexity with something in simplicity. So he says, you know that... That which soweth, thou sowest, verse 36, is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain, it may chance of wheat or some other grain. So what he's saying is this. You got these seeds and you're getting ready to plant a wheat harvest. Well, if you leave the seeds in the paper sack that you bought them from, from the, from the nursery, if you leave the seeds in the jar that they were sitting in, are they ever going to grow? Are they ever going to bear their fruit? Are they ever going to produce the vegetables or the grain, the wheat specifically that Paul referred to? No, if you don't sow it, it's not going to die to itself and raise up, is it? No. Uh, they, have, they have found seeds in the pyramids that are thousands upon thousands of years old that they have taken out and planted in seeds that were five to 6,000 years of age. As soon as they were planted in water, they sprung up and bore fruit. But they sat there for, you, you got to sow the seed. You know what? Good news, bad news, bad news, good news. If you want a resurrection, you got you to die to live again. Do you know even the rapture, and Paul's going to begin to describe that at the end of the chapter, but by definition, even those that, and everybody wants to go to the rapture. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. You know, we all, everybody sings that song, and that's true. If you don't feel that way, uh, you, you're a little, honestly, you're just a little cuckoo. It's natural. I, I don't know about you. I'd rather go with the upper taker than the undertaker. Amen? All right? I'm close friends with Todd Walton, but I, I hope we remain that way till the rapture of the church, okay? And so I, I, uh, that, that resurrection, even the rapture, is a, the, this mortality is putting on immortality, this corruption is putting on incorruption. Even that translation to some degree is the experience of death to a degree. You may not have a funeral service, you may not be buried six feet under, but you have to die to live again. And when a seed is sown in the ground, it dies, but in the process of time, it rises from the ground, but it doesn't come up a seed, does it? It's in a different form. And then that cycle starts over again in perpetuation. So we begin, the seed dies, and in death it is dissolves. Our bodies are formed from the dust of the earth. And, and, and when our bodies die, uh, when we die, our bodies dissolve into their natural state. They return to the dust from whence we are taken. People say, well, I don't believe that. Well, let me tell you something. You can encapsulate yourself in a coffin that is sealed. Look, wait, you ever think about the, the lengths that we go to, okay, I mean, we spend large money on a coffin and a concrete vault. And I mean, to put somebody we love that is not there. And you can put them, I mean, you can vacuum seal them. And if you pull that thing out of the ground and no worms have gotten in and no water's gotten in and, and no bugs have gotten to them. And to be quite honest, and I don't mean to be cold or callous, but what does it matter? What does it, honestly, what does it matter? Look, people have been buried that way for thousands of years. What we do today is very recent. I'm not saying it's wrong. Please don't misunderstand me. But what I'm saying is, if you give it 100 years and you pull that thing up, you know what you're going to find? You're going to find a pile of dust and ashes. People say, I don't believe we're dust and ashes. Well, give yourself 100 years, you'll find out. You know, you go out to the cemetery. You know, the reasons that cemeteries have... Um, um, requirements that you have a concrete liner 
is because it provides a smooth level surface beneath the earth. Because if you're buried in a wooden box, in, in the proverbial pine box like that, and our sir, you can go out to our church cemetery and you can see it for your own self. Even that wooden box will decay over time, does it not? And the box and the, and the body decays, and then what happens is it creates a sinkhole, and, and that's where you get those depressions in the ground right in front of the tombstones in the older cemeteries that are 100, 150 years old like ours is, 170-some years old ours is. Why? Because when we die, we return to our natural state, and death is a reality of life. But that seed... Once it dies, except a corn of wheat, Jesus said, I think Mark 12, 24, die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. The seed, seed rises from the ground, reconstituted in a different form. It was a seed. Now it's a stalk full of grains of wheat. Wheat is what Paul is using. Uh, we could use it for anything. Look, we're, we're right now, we're watching all the combines go out and cut the beans and, and shell corn, right? And uh, I could sit there inside the road and just watch them do that. I like watching them cut beans and, and shell corn. But, you know, one... One kernel of corn that's planted will bear two to three ears and uh, with several hundred kernels on each, on, on each one of those ears of corn. It, it's reconstituted, and that's what the resurrection's like. One, we die one at a time, but boy, when we come up, we're coming out by the, by the thousands in a different form. And the stock of wheat will continue to perpetuate that cycle of life and sowing and reaping over and over again. We were pulling stuff out of the garden uh, just, just the other day, and Jenny said, make sure you throw those plants down the ravine so we don't get the volunteers. You, you all know what that means. It means that something, something's going to come back up. You'll get, I, I've had years in that ravine where the next summer I've had cucumbers come up, I've had squash come up, I've had tomato plants come up. I threw those plants over, but there's some seed in there, and seed will bear its fruit. And so he's using something that's familiar to us to explain something with a material illustration of something mystical that we don't, uh, that we, that we don't uh, necessarily understand. And that's the resurrection in a nutshell. It is a dissolution, a dissolving, a reconstruction, and a perpetuation. Aren't you glad that when we come up, we will live forever? We will never die again. That those who have a, a, a new birth, those who have been born again, that the second death hath no power over resurrection life. And so that, and then he goes on, he gives more illustration. God gives everything a different kind of body. Paul's going to be talking about there's a terrestrial, an earthly body. There is a celestial, a heavenly body. Well, we can understand we all have different kinds of body. Good night, look around the room. We all have different kinds of bodies, don't we? Okay. And uh, I, I've never met anybody that was happy with the one that they had, all right? Uh, I, I mean, that's why people change the color of their contact lenses. That's why they spend, you, you know, you think they go to a body shop to get their fingernails and their toenails done. And we're not, go, we're not going into all that tonight, all right? And uh, even the guys are doing it these days, which means they're really not men at all, all right? But God gives everything a specific kind of a, a, a kind of body according to his good pleasure but God verse 38 giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body all flesh is not the same kind of the same flesh but there is one kind of flesh of men didn't he give mankind a different kind of body from everything else our body is reflects the image and likeness of God's own this body's going to die, it's going to dissolve, it's, but it's going to be rejuvenated, continue to live at the resurrection. The, the human body already does that in a natural way. How many have ever heard this, that you, your body is completely brand new, not the same, every seven years? Did they, how many of you went to school and they taught that? Okay, okay. They, they used to say that you're, you get a brand new body every seven years. Now I understand as we go from infancy to childhood to, to our adolescent years and adulthood, and, and then we begin to age but it's talk, that when they're talking about is our cellular uh, construction of rejuvenation. Uh, you have 330 billion cells that die and are replaced in the human body every single day. You didn't even know that was happening. That is 1% of your cells. Think about that. 330 billion cells in your bodies will die today and be replaced, and that is 1%. Now, they don't all do so at the same time, okay? 
There are different types of cells, even in these same bodies that rejuvenate at different times. Your colon cells rejuvenate every three to five days. They have to, the way Americans eat. Can I get a witness, all right? Uh, you, but our fat and our muscle cells can take up to 70 years. Red blood cells, 120 days. Skin cells, every two to four weeks. Hair cells in women, every six years, but in men, every three weeks, which is why we have to go to the barber so often. Your liver cells rejuvenate every 150 to 500 days, depending on uh, who you are. Um, the cells that line our stomach last only about five days. Bone cells will last for 10 years. Overall, on average, our cells average about seven years, which is why they say that you are not the man you used to be. From, you know, I'm 49. I'm on my seventh body. I did not know that until today, okay? And it's, they're getting to be like dog years, okay? But uh, don't, don't be harsh on me. Some of you are older dogs than I am, okay? But our natural body is going to continue this cycle, but it is going to age, and one day it's going to die. Our resurrected body never dies. Now, the beasts of the earth, they have a different kind of body, don't they? It doesn't matter if they're a predator or a prey. They, all have, they, they don't all have the same kind of flesh. That's why we like going to the zoo. I love going to the zoo. You know why? Because not all animals look the same. The, the, the gorilla uh, and the hippo, they don't look alike, do they? The, 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 uh, uh, the duck-billed platypus and a the zebra, they don't look the same. Elephants have different bodies than a sloth, the lion and the buffalo, a cat and a dog. Uh, you can go on and on. There, there are different kinds of body. God gave another kind of body to the fish, suitable for their environment. They have that sleek, torpedo-like body, and even those have different shapes, but they have, uh, they have those fins that can steer and bodies that can glide through the water, and they have gills so that water passes over them and provides them with oxygen. And, you know, the average person, you, you know, cannot hold their breath underwater for more than a minute. And you might be some Harry Houdini and be able to go for two minutes, and there are a few that have gone for five, and I know about the pearl divers that can go. But, but on the whole, the average human being, the 8 billion people on this planet, most people, honestly, can't hold their breath underwater for 30 seconds. 30 seconds would be good for most people. God gave the fish a different type of body for the, suitable to the environment. Same, it's the same way with the birds. Uh, they've been given a different type of flesh that allows them to fly through the air. They have aerodynamic wings as opposed to arms like we have that allow the wind, currents of the wind to pass beneath them and lift them up into the heavens. They, they're, they're, our bones are, are dense and good night. We got to start taking vitamin D as soon as you turn, you know, 39 like Jack Benny so that you can keep your bones strong and healthy. Everybody's taking vitamin D3. If, if you don't know what that is, it's just good. You ain't there yet. You will be, okay? Why? Because human beings have strong, dense bones. But the bones of a bird's uh, body are, are hollow to keep them light. So that they can, again, uh, th so that they can continue to reduce weight, so that they can soar in the heights. You know, when I was a boy, me and my brothers, we'd get on the bunk beds, we'd tie a, a blanket around our neck, and we would spread out our wings, and we would try to fly, and we would fall like hammers. Okay? Why? Because we got a different kind of body. And you can jump up, but you're coming down. We have, you know, you're just not going to fly. So these are things that the church could easily uh, under, uh, observe and understand that there are different kinds of bodies on, on this earth. And in the same manner, there are celestial, heavenly bodies and terrestrial, earthly bodies. Our, our celestial body, our heavenly body, is going to be completely different than the one we have now. In fact, as we go on in this chapter, you're going to find, and it's one of the great answers to one of the great questions a lot of Christians today ask. Well, if people are in heaven, they have a heavenly body, why do they need a glorified body in the resurrection? Because there's different kinds of heavenly bodies. They, they went to a grave in the Old Testament. Now, God has given them a temporary heavenly body right now. Uh, they, they recognize Samuel, did not Saul and the witch recognize Samuel when he came out of the grave. His body was similar. It was close enough that he could see, he re, Saul recognized who he was, but it wasn't a physical body. 
And the, when Jesus died at the resurrection, the graves were open. The Old Testament saints came out. People recognized those individuals. So your heavenly body, I hate to, I hate to tell you this, but some of you are, are going to be disappointed. You're still going to look like you. No matter how discontented you have been all your life, okay? You're still going to look like you. All right? You'll probably be the best version of you there is to have, but you're not going to care about that up there, okay? Uh, but uh, are, are you all awake tonight? All right? Just checking. But you're, you're going to have, and, and there is a glorified body, and if you've been in Sunday school, you'll understand this. That is our predestination. When we will, our, our body will be changed, fashioned like unto his, like unto Jesus. The people that have a heavenly body now do not have a body. It's a celestial body, but it is not a body that is glorified, fashioned like unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Not yet. That's why, they, that's why the dead in Christ have to rise first. Because they, need a res, they still need a resurrection to give them the predestination of a heavenly body that will be transformed and fashioned like unto Christ. It's a different body. You know, in both the Gospel of Mark and Luke, there is the story of the Sadducees, Mark chapter 12 and Luke chapter 20, where they came and they tried, remember, they tried to track, uh, catch Jesus in a trap, and they said, okay, so there was this woman, and, and she had a husband, and she didn't bear him a child, and according to the Jewish law, the man died, so she had to marry his brother, and the first child be named after the first brother, and the second child be named after the second brother, but this poor guy died, and she, he ne she never had any children by him, so she married the third, and on and on and on, this went till seven brethren had died, and of course, they cre created something that was superlative that probably never actually happened. And if it did, the poor woman died of exhaustion after seven brothers, I would think. And, 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 and they said, so in the resurrection, if there is a resurrection, Jesus, whose wife is he? And what did he say? Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures. He said, we won't have the same kind of body. For we shall be as the angels, which, are, which neither marry nor are given in marriage, Jesus said. It's a different type of body. Uh, we're going to be the bride of Christ. Let me tell you something. You're going to get a better marriage someday, okay? All right? And I'm happy if you're happy now, but the best is yet to come, okay? So uh, the, they were, uh, we're not going to, the, the bodies that are celestial are not going to have that same type of a relationship. It's different. And so he goes on, look what he says here. Verse 40. Uh, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory, notice the word glory, of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Each one has their own unique, you know, this, this earthly body uh, that we have, it has its own glory. It is created in the image and likeness of God. Your spirit still communes with God. We do enjoy uh, the privileges of, of a divine institution and marriage and children and different things and family relationships and love. There is a glory. Okay, it's not all bad. And there is a glory of the celestial. And then he goes on in, this, in verse 41. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the star. For one star differeth from another star in glory. You know, the stars, there are small stars and medium-sized stars and large stars. There's dwarf stars and there's all kinds of things out there. That, that, that is inexhaustible when you get into... Remember, there's a difference between astronomy, which is the science based on what we know, and astrology, which uses uh, an unclean spirit to use the stars to work in, uh, in supernatural ways in darkness. Okay, but in, in astronomy, uh, we understand there's all kinds of different stars and galaxies and all these things, and, uh, and they're each one different. I believe there's a foreshadow in this verse, okay? Remember, and you've heard me teach on this before, preach on this, that in the Garden of Eden, something happened when Adam and Eve took the forbidden fruit, and the Bible says that they knew that they were naked and they were ashamed. They were naked before and they were not ashamed. What changed? And I believe according to the book of Psalms, the Bible tells us that God is clothed, I think it's in Psalm chapter 103, that God is clothed in light. And I believe that they were clothed in the light of God. And when man sin, sin plunges us into darkness, God is light and in him is no darkness at all, uh, that, 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 that the, they lost the light of God. 
And losing the light of God and being plunged into the darkness of sin, it revealed the shame of their nakedness. Even though they were a man and a wife, because it wasn't that there was a shame as a husband and a wife. It was a shame that, remember, nakedness is offense to the holiness of God. It has nothing to do with the fact that it might or might not create lust. It has nothing to do with the fact that you want to get a tan or that you want to enjoy yourself at the beach. It has everything to do with offending the holiness of God. And here, I believe that in our celestial bodies, where the Lamb is the light of heaven, that we will once again be clothed in the light of God. There is no sun, there is no moon, and there are no stars in, the, in heaven, according to Revelation chapter 21, 22. The Lamb is the light. And I believe that we'll be clothed with that light again. And I believe, based on our work and our witness, that some people are going to shine bright as the sun, some are going to be more like the moon and some are going to be like the stars. And if you look out there, there are stars that shine very brightly, other stars that are smaller and they're not as bright. What determines that? Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, speaking of the resurrection, says this, many of them that sleep in the dust, that's what our body is made of, the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, that's the resurrection, and some to shame and everlasting contempt, that's the, the lost in hell. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I, if I could encourage you in just one point tonight, it would be this. Imagine if we are clothed with the light of God in heaven, but our brightness is determined by the faithfulness of our witness for Jesus Christ. By the money we invested in missions, that 24-hour radio missionary, by the tracks we passed out, the doors we knocked on, the people that we prayed for, the people that we wept over, the people that we told time and time again. I don't want to get to heaven and look like a three-watt light bulb standing next to a 5,000 lumen light, light hanging up in the garage. And folks, there is coming a day, I promise you, when we would give worlds to go back and shine and endure all our earthly sufferings and count them as nothing. And we are taught repeatedly time and time again. By the way, this carnal church fixed their problems in sec according to 2 Corinthians. I have to wonder if this, wasn't, if this wasn't the point, the turning point for them. This is, man, all this other stuff. This meets offered idols. Uh, the, the, this fornication, this guy that's living with this father's wife and, and all the other problems, this popularity contest we're running in, this problem with the gift of tongues that we're wasting our time on it. It's nothing but a senseless distraction and on and on and on. If this wasn't the turning point, the catalyst that says, I don't, I don't want to be a three-watt nightlight in eternity, but I want to burn and shine as the brightness of the stars forever and ever. Because one day, we will be sown in corruption and raised in incorruption. We'll have a resurrected body that will never again decay. It will never again die. It will live forever. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. This body is a seed that is sown in dishonor. Our lives have been dishonored by sin. They have dishonored God. They have defended His holiness. They will be raised in glory. Uh, this is one of the scriptures that we use to refer to our resurrected body as our glorification, our glorified state. We will bring to God the eternal glory that is due to Him. Never dishonor Him again. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. These terrestrial bodies are very, very weak. And we spend a lot of time, a lot of those people in this world spend a lot of their time devoting themselves to developing a power. And really all they possess is a tremendous amount of weakness. I mean, people will, will, will improve their lives with diet and exercise in order to perform feats of strength, gymnastics. You ever see these strongman contests, athletic events, whatever sports, so on? And yet somebody, they can trip over a stone, roll an ankle, and be on crutches the same day, can't they? But they ran 26.3 miles and ran a marathon. You could, you could sprain your ankle and be done. Strong man can pull a muscle, and he can't pick up a gallon of milk let alone pull an airplane on a rope, right? Uh, strong people break bones, get down on their back, develop diseases in their hearts and lungs, 
Wake, the one day those people wake up and they find that they have cancer. Uh, I read the story. Of, it was a person I, I'd never even heard of their name. He was big in some kind of a, a, a sporting event. I don't even remember what it was. Maybe someone with dirt bikes or something like that. 34 years old that died. I never heard of the guy. He was well known in his. 34 years old, gone. We are, we are sown in weakness. You might develop mental acuity and an aptitude that gets you a high score uh, on, on, uh, on the SATs or, or win a spelling bee, but you get a headache and you can't concentrate, can you? These bodies are very weak. Do you understand that when we leave here, everybody is worried that we'll get home in time to what? I know to eat again, but to get to bed. Because the average human being spends one-third of their life resting just so that they can get up and go on for a few hours, and most of them don't go on very well, do they? Do you understand there's coming a day when these very weak bodies will be raised in resurrection power? Nothing will prevent us from bringing glory to God. We will never get tired. We will never sleep. We will never break a bone. We will never become ill. We'll never be destroyed by age or disease. What a body. Look, that body... We spend a lot of time devoted to bodies here. That and I'm by the way, I'm. This is not any. This, this there's no honor in neglecting it and abusing it either. You ought to be good stewards of the temple of God, so that you could do God's will, God's will, not our will, but His His will for for this life. Be good stewards. But the weakness that we experience, there's going to be a day where you're going to join that crowd, and just getting out of bed. You're going to be excited about that. And I mean that literally. You're just going to be excited that you have the strength to get out of bed on your own power. You're going to be excited one day. You never think anything about going and doing whatever you want. You're going to be excited that you took 10 steps on a walker or holding onto a rail in a hospital room someday if Jesus tarries. You're going to be excited about that. You're just going to be excited about things that you don't even want to think about the things you're going to be excited about. And if you want to know, you ask Brother Phil. He'll tell you all about it. But we are going to be raised in resurrection power. But right now, it's our time to shine. Because how you shine here, how you let your light shine before men so that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven, determines how we shine for all eternity. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. We pray that uh, your word, Lord, has been a help to your people. Our, our lives are very brief and very frail. And Father, we pray that tonight that we would just be reminded, Lord, not to be that one that stands wishing for worlds to come that could be ours, but never were because we didn't shine for Jesus in the life that you gave us. We ask now that, Lord, that tonight those that come and, Lord, simply come in a house of prayer uh, to bring uh, their, their needs and their loved ones before your throne tonight, that you would meet with us as we humble ourselves in your sight and those in response to the message in Jesus' name. Let's stand. The piano's playing. The altar's open. Something that was said that the Lord spoke to your heart along the way. Maybe some personal need that you just need to come and bring before the Lord tonight. You're in a house of prayer. Why don't you come do business with the Lord?